So I'm going to talk about uh, the existence of twi twisted big Kähler Einstein metrics. This is a joint work with Kei Zhang, who's at the Beijing Normal University. Okay, and I'm in the fortunate situation that Rami already sort of uh, fleshed out this topic one, so I will complement some things uh, uh, in his presentation. So, starting off about the setting, right? So, we are uh, working on a compact Kähler manifold. It, the setting will also force it to be projective, but we won't use too much of that. And then I will f want to first explain to you what's the Ricci curvature of a uh, positive current. Right? So uh, th this, this perhaps should complement uh, something that was already in uh, not too much in the start. So Remy said, you know, uh, Kähler Einstein metrics are solutions to this PDE. And then Laszlo asked, oh, but where's the Ricci curvature, what not? So, so may, may, maybe this could, this could help in uh, giving a more rounder picture. So how do we, so, so we have a, uh, right, uh, so according to the Swedish school, right, uh, one must always fix a uh, uh, reference, uh, reference uh, form, right? Okay, okay, may, well, maybe not, but I'm doing it anyway, right? So the theta is going to be fixed for the whole, whole talk representing a big cohomology class. And uh, I am taking a potential corresponding to theta, and I'm trying to understand how to define the Ricci curvature of theta u. Okay, so one thinks about this a little bit, and maybe the definition is elusive, but one, that, one thing that we, we perhaps agree upon is that this uh, discrepancy formula for Ricci curvatures should hold whatever, whatever definition I take. So in case of smooth metrics, we have this nice formula between the difference of two Ricci curvatures. Uh, omega here is smooth, so I know what this is. And then if I could understand what this thing is, maybe I, should, I can take this as, as the definition. So, so that's what I'm doing here. So I will define the Ricci curvature of positive currents only if I can make sense of this. So DDC of log of the density of the non-pluripolar uh, complex mont pair measure of theta u to the n over omega to the n. So if I happen to be in the fortunate case that uh, the non-pluripolar complex mont pair is uh, absolutely continuous with respect to omega, then this quotient makes sense. I take a log. And I only ask of it that it's integrable. Okay, so I'm kicking out a bunch of uh, elements from PSHX, but there's plenty here. Why? Well, uh, because of the BEGZ, right? So in BEGZ, they prove Yao's theorem, meaning that uh, this theta u to the n can be, for example, any f times omega to the n. So uh, there's always going to be plenty of elements here. And for those, I know what the Ricci curvature is. Okay, so I'm looking at those and I want to see if I can find a canonical metrics among them, right? So then we get to this uh, understanding of what Kähler me Einstein metrics are and I'm going to talk about twisted Kähler Einstein metrics in, in the big sense. So uh, I'm going to assume for this talk that uh, the first churn class uh, splits as my big class theta plus a pseudo-effective class. So eta is the smooth form that will represent the pseudo-effective class. This only means that this, the pure subharmonic function with respect to eta is non-empty and automatically big plus pseudo-effective is always big, so I get the condition for the rest of the talk that negative kx has to be big. Okay, so I'm picking a psi here and I want to find u with minimal singularity, such that Ricci theta u is equal to theta u plus this twisting eta psi. So when, when there's nothing here, so, so it's, it's possible that I take the trivial class, which is pseudo-effective, then I'm back to the case of Kähler Einstein metrics, otherwise I'm twisted. Okay, and if I manage to find such a metric, so such metrics are called, of course, twisted Kähler Einstein metrics. Now you can nibble around with the coefficient here, you can put here a lambda. We know how that works. You can suck that into the cohomology class. So uh, 
here I'm strictly focusing on lambda equals one, and okay, so then you look at this equation, you also look at the defining formula for Ricci theta u, you play around with that exactly as in the smooth case, and then you arrive at Remy's equation down here. So up to a constant, this equation is equivalent with this complex Monjean pair equation, where on the right hand side, you have e to the f minus u minus psi. Psi was, again, the potential of the twisting form here, and f is the corresponding uh, Ricci potential, which comes about you solving this uh, elliptic PD, right? So it's a smooth uh, function. Okay, so we're staring at uh, this second order PD now. We want to find uh, solutions with minimal singularity, and you know the story, right? From the ample case, uh, Remy sort of expanded on it, so I will uh, hobble over it. Unfortunately, solutions don't exist in general, and the goal often is to find algebraic criteria to guarantee existence that in a very sort of economical manner, so you're hoping that these uh, conditions that guarantee existence will also be necessary. So we want to really characterize situations algebraically where these canonical metrics exist. And there's a bunch of such conditions. Usually they fall under the umbrella of case stability. So our choice for this work is to work with delta invariants. So these have been developed in the last 10-ish, maybe 15 years, started out by Fujita Odaka, if I'm not mistaken. And we will be specifically looking at the analytic reinterpretation by Bloom Johnson, right? So we are looking at this delta invariant that's attached to my class theta and the singularity, the twisting singularity psi. So this is infimum E of A psi E over S E. Okay, let me explain what, what all these symbols are. So E, E is going to be a divisor over X. So E is a divisor that doesn't live on X, but on a birational model of, uh, of X. Uh, and then here I take uh, a bimeromorphic max from y to x, and then e lives in y. Now, uh, you can do this also in the projective role. So, so, you, so you, you can squeeze in the word projective in there. We have a note somewhere in the paper that delta invariant will be the same. Uh, okay, so you know what e is? You're taking the infimum over all such e. What, are, what is a psi e? So a psi e is the twisted log discrepancy. So it's a x e, the log discrepancy, minus the long number of psi along e. Right? So what's the twisted log discrepancy? Well, it's 1 plus the vanishing order of the Jacobian of pi along e. Right? So that's essentially what's encoded here. Minus the long number of psi along e. What's that? Well, what you need to do is you need to pull back psi to y, and then along e, check all the long numbers. The smallest long number will be uh, this uh, long number of psi along e, and then by su semi-continuity, you get that actually this minimum the long number is generically obtained. So if you were to randomly pick a point where you test it, there's a 100% chance that you get the minimum minimum number, which is, which is this one here. Okay, sorry, oh, oh, oh. All right, so that explains sort of what's here in the top. At the bottom, this has many names. I know it by the sort of average, uh, the long number of the class with, with respect to E. So there's a lot to sort of process here. It's an integral going from zero to uh, tau theta E. So the tau theta E is essentially the Sushadri constant of the big class theta with respect to E, right? So you, it's the biggest number tau, such that the class of tau minus, sorry, it's a class of theta minus tau E is still big, okay? So there's various ways to say what this is. Another way of saying is that it's, tau is the biggest Le long number, a, a potential in PSHX tau can have. Uh, so it's, it's, it's some sort of extremizer. Okay, so then you integrate from zero to tau here, the volume of this class, which is big, so it makes sense what you're doing here, 
and you're averaging up over the total volume. So you get some quantity here, and you know, if, if you think about it a little bit, you, this can be interpreted as the sort of the, the long number along E of an average element of, 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 of a randomly picked theta PSH function. Maybe. Okay, good. So anyway, we have the divisorial data and we're testing stability of our uh, geometry using uh, the, this divisorial data. Okay, so I think that in a nutshell sort of explains the so-called delta invariant. So now our, our main result can be uh, sort of stated that way. So if this delta invariant is strictly greater than one, so the twisted delta invariant, the psi twisted delta invariant greater than one, then there exists a twisted theta, twisted killer einstein metric uh, satisfying the, this equation, which again is equivalent to the scalar equation down here. All right, so a few words need to be said. So this is uh, an extension of a result that is already found in Berman, Books and Mion. So in the ample case, there uh, it, it's a slightly different terms. Perhaps this result is written down. Uh, again, in that, their case, negative kx is ample, and theta and eta are maybe not integral, but q q line bundles. I don't remember exactly. Uh, now, conversely, conversely, if a unique killer Einstein metric exists then one can also show that the uh, delta invariant is greater than one. Uh, this is more or less in line with, with what Remy talked about, and the proof of this is, is, is also very similar to what they do. So from you having a unique, the emphasis on unique a canonical metric, the existing techniques uh, uh, show you that uh, dating energy is coercive, and then you go from coercivity of the big energy to basically descend to a algebraic stability condition. So in, in their case, it was via test configuration. In this case, it is via delta invariant. Uh, okay, but uh, again, I, I said in the beginning, we want the condition that characterizes. So what's missing to have a two-sided uh, result is the word unique from here. So notice a uh, twisted killer Einstein metric, not a unique one. So we definitely expect that there's a, that word is missing from here, but we can't get that yet because we don't have a bando Mabuchi type uniqueness theorem in our transcendental setting here. Since unfortunately, or fortunately, it is tied up in a conjecture of Bernson that I'm, I'm going to remind you. So uh, Bernson in his uh, Inventionis paper where he obtains uh, all sorts of different families of Bando Mabuchi type uniqueness theorems mentions the possibility of a sort of very general version that will probably have all or most of the ones stated there under the umbrella whereas you take a subgeodesic in the class of negative kx so that's uh, theta plus eta in my case right so you take a subgeodesic segment here and then by, uh, 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 I'm going to allude to it later again, by, by Cohn and Bernson, it's known that this, this uh, correspondence, so t to negative log this expression, is actually convex. Now, if it happens to be linear, then it's expected that this subgeodesic is actually a geodesic induced by automorphism. So if, if one can get that, then uh, one, one should be able to show existence, uh, so uniqueness in our theorem, and then we would have a two-sided characterization. Now, uh, regarding this conjecture, I mean, there have been some, uh, maybe, you know, partial progress in our brain, also during this conference, but a full proof is not written out yet. I'm optimistic that maybe, maybe in the near future we'll, we'll, we'll be able to get this, and then this whole picture will be uh, complete here. Okay, but this is where we are right now. All right, good. So some, some, some further notes, some remarks that need to be said here about the perceived novelties of our result and also limitations. It's, it's, yes? What? It's for all t. For all, all t. All t, all t. What do you mean by all t? What do you mean by all t? Well, I'm taking a genetic 
segment between zero and one, but you can parameterize it any, any segment you want. So the whole, the whole segment has to be a very simple geodesic given by all the markets. That needs to be proved. Okay, so some notes here, right? So transcendental, you know, that's a word that you will hear from me a lot, right? So our techniques are transcendental. Uh, I wouldn't dare to call it sort of out of, out of the blue new approach to uh, uh, case stability. Uh, if you, you know, spend a little time with our work, you will see all these sort of divisorial criteria, which is also the uh, cornerstone of the non-Archimedean approach. So if, I think one way of putting it uh, sort of colloquially, I think our techniques are sort of the analytic cousin of the, of the non-Archimedean approach. Uh, so due to the fact that, you know, we, we, we sort of fixate on transcendental ingredients, we obtain a transcendental YTD type theorem. Uh, so this uh, uh, is seen by the fact that theta and eta are really uh, transcendental uh, big classes in uh, the big cone. Now, before I do a victory lap with this, immediately I have to mention the limitation because there is one. So there's the setting uh, uh, forces something that needs to be mentioned. So if a Kähler-Einstein metric does exist, which we definitely hope to exist, then uh, negative Kx has to contain a positive KLT current, namely the, Kähler, the current coming from the Kähler-Einstein plus eta C, the twisting, right? So, I mean, this is easily seen if, you, if I roll back to the equation. Right? You look at the right-hand side of the equation. I, I have to be able to integrate this. Look, what do you see here in the exponent? U plus psi, right? So then this current here needs to be, okay, this current needs to be KLT. Now, if there's a KLT current in negative KX, then my model vanishing, right? The second cohomology class of holomorphic uh, sheaf is zero, implying that every uh, class is... Uh, a R linear combination of uh, integrals, right? So even though we are in the big cone, right, uh, both theta and eta are essentially R line bundles. Okay, so uh, the question is, like, how, really, how transcendental is this? I mean, you can definitely uh, approach R line bundles by Q line bundles, and at least in my mind, that's already algebraic well, right? So the question is, can you recover the result uh, in, 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 in the current form for R line bundles coming from Q line bundles, right? So playing a bit of devil's advocate. Well, the issue that you run into immediately is uh, the, neither the twisted delta invariant or its untwisted part is known to be continuous in the big cone. Uh, it's known to be continuous in the alpha cone, but in the big cone, there's this issue with how the potential of And unless this is argued, which, which I believe to be true, that the delta uh, invariant, or in our case, the twisted version, is continuous on the big cone, this type of approximation by uh, Q-line bundles will not work. So perhaps you allow me to insist still that we, we do have a, 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 a transcendental Y-type theorem, perhaps the first, uh, the first one known, even though, right, the setting could be even more transcendental, right? Now, again, is it possible to avoid this condition altogether? Well, th there is a way, potential way. We can't do it yet. So the limitation would not persist. So Nadal would not be applicable if you would be able to twist by a not necessarily uh, pseudo-effective current at psi here. And this, in the ample case, is doable, right? So my collaborator did exactly just that. We can't do it in the big case. He did it using quantization, which is in the realm of algebra. Uh, we purposefully want to avoid that in our case. But even if we wanted to use uh, his techniques, unfortunately, as you know, in the big case, uh, things as basic as osawa takeguchi type theorems, you know, go out the window because potentials with minimal singularity type do not contain uh, currents. Uh, 
uh, sorry, Kähler currents, right? So this, that problem persists, but uh, we do expect, and you know, either us or maybe somebody else will be able to uh, obtain a version of our result without uh, at upside being positive, and that will be truly, truly uh, transcendental in the sense that you could go deep, deep into the Kähler core away from the neuron severity classes. Okay, yes? Sorry? There is a, a spot that we got stuck by not being able to use a Safa Takegoshi. And then, again, the sticking point is that among potentials of minimal singularity type in a big class, there is no Kähler current. If there were, you would immediately be a Kähler class. Uh, okay, good. Uh, let me tell you some more remarks. Okay, so again, another perceived novelty. Uh, our method give a very general framework to prove why TD existence theorem of, of the following nature. So delta invariant greater than one implies existence of certain type of uh, uh, killer einstein metrics. Uh, there is really one ingredient that's non-negotiable, uh, convexity of the appropriate Ding functional, right? So in our case, that is handled by uh, uh And then many of you could think of other situation where, where this result is known or expected to be known, as soon as that result is uh, established, uh, I believe that, you know, following our, our steps, you will be able to prove a, a YTD type existence theorem of the sort, uh, again, delta pot greater than one implies uh, existence of your uh, canonical metric. Now throw in uniqueness, throw in uniqueness, and then you get a two-sided characterization. That's the part that we're missing Okay, now again, I'm, again, I'm somewhat biased. I've been following this uh, uh, study of Kähler Einstein metrics which prescribed singularities by Trussiani. I think this is a prime candidate to, to sort of carry out this, this type of analysis. So, sorry, but just um, the convexity of the thing. And, and ugly, so. So the good is that I think that this is a generic method, but the bad is that the transcendental classes are uh, with really very close to the neuron severity clock. Yeah. You have to decide what, what you look at. Everybody has to do that, so do we. Okay. Uh, yeah, so along these sort of very ge uh, general framework to prove ITD theorems, Let's look at the algebraic case when there's no twisting. 
so we give a very short proof of this result of uh, Li Tian Wang, where you take a log final pair uh, with positive delta invariant, and then you get, a, a, in that case, a unique Kähler Einstein metric. And until a few days ago, I mean, this was sort of the end of the story here, right? But there is a plot twist by Chen Yan Chu. It, uh, also, I mean, we, we knew a couple slightly earlier, but uh, the, the, also the work appeared now on archive. So it turns out that, yes, our methods imply Li Tian Wang, but in this, this algebraic case, it's actually true vice versa as well. So what's going on? So Chen Yan Shu noticed that in case negative kx is big and you're stable, x is actually log Fano. So log Fano by uh, BCHM means that it's a Mori dream space. So every big line bundle has finitely generated section ring. Okay, so in, in particular, the section ring of uh, negative kx is finitely generated. So, you know, then you're extremely tempted to look at the, uh, pr uh, the proj of this uh, section ring. You do that, let's call that y. You immediately get a, a, bi a birational map into y. So uh, this is not the map, I should have written y you know, dash. You resolve this map, and then some sort of very, very attractive analysis arises. Uh, without going into details, right, so what you can show is that this y is singular, but uh, a q fano that's stable, so it admits a kähler einstein metric. So again, sl slightly stretching uh, precision, what you can do is you can pull back this kähler einstein metric from here onto x, and that will be essentially the kähler einstein metric on, on, on x. Not quite, in reality it will be the kähler einstein metric will be the pullback kähler einstein metric plus a divisorial singularity, but that you can always Right? So, all in all, right, we have here in the very important algebraic case sort of two uh, possible ways of doing things, either, doing, uh, either uh, using pluripotential theory, as, as we develop it, or you use this landmark result in minimal model program. And in that case, our result can be reduced to the uh, re re result for log final pairs by Li Tian Fang. Right, so geometric problem having two, in, uh, you know, almost, com I mean, non-intersecting approaches, one from algebra, one from analysis, I, I, think, I think this is uh, essentially the definition of our field, right? Now, before, uh, before I get very emotional, right, I should mention, I should mention that we, we, we've seen instances of this. So this, this in, our, in our field, right? So, in BEGZ, there is a very, very similar situation, right? So if you read BEGZ as carefully as I did, then there's a passage there that points out something eerily similar, right? So if Kx is big, in that case, the authors uh, uh, put together finite energy pluripotential theory to construct a killer einstein metric uh, on Kx. And even there they point out you can do this, or you can use there also BCHM, uh, more or less the same way as here, uh, to reduce the problem of Kx being big to Kx being ample and x singular, and this is a case handled by EGZ. So again, over there you also have this alternative, either completely analytical or minimal model program. Same thing here, the only extra ingredient is the stability. This was very surprising to me. I did not expect this. So, yeah, definitely for me, this was a plot twist. Right, good. So, uh, uh, with regards to the general case, uh, obviously this uh, BCHM uh, approach, it's, it's not going to help, but, but this, is, this is definitely a very important particular case where uh, lots of different options are available. <laughs> Okay, so in the remainder of my talk, let me expand a little bit on the analysis and, and, and how, we, how we approach this. Okay, so ingredients. So our main ingredients are this sort of Rotwitz, Roswitz Nistrom correspondence um, between uh, geodesic rays and maximum test curves. 
aided by the relative pluripotential theory developed by my collaborators, Dinette Zalou and myself. Uh, the evaluative criteria for integrability, as I've learned it from BBJ and books of Aubrey is definitely also, you know, pretty much on every page, multiple times. Uh, strong Guanzu openness theorem, again, we use the version that I learned in the appendix of BBJ. And last but not least, the convexity of the Ding energy that was again pointed out as the non-negotiable ingredient in all this story uh, due to burn some time. Okay, good. So, being even more specific, this uh, sort of twisted Ding energy, uh, lambda twisted Ding energy, is going to play an important role. So you, you, you might recognize this expression from uh, many different works. Uh, in case lambda is equal to 1, right? So in case of lambda is equal to 1, we're talking about the actual Ding energy. But here we allow lambda to be positive. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to say why this extra lambda parameter plays a role. Uh, I, I think, you know, this lambda trick already probably goes back to BBJ, right? Did it? Did, did, did it? Maybe, maybe not. I, I've learned it from pa pa papers of my co-author. Uh, 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 but again, given what I'm, I'm about to say, I wouldn't be surprised that you know, this is coming from other places. Uh, okay, so our first a result that I think is novel and it's extremely helpful, it's actually very simple. Uh, so it says, okay, so you have a subgeodesic ray. Okay, I won't define that, it will take me too much time. Again, so think of a subgeodesic ray as a plurisubharmonic function on C times C cross X, right? <coughs> so you can put such subgeodesic ray into these lambda ding functionals and study the slope as T goes to infinity. Now, one thing that I have to note here, for lambda equals one, we know that this is convex, right? So that in that case, the limit exists here, but typically it doesn't, right? So the, the best thing I can put here is either liminf or limsup. I put liminf. So there's a formula for this in the following manner. So uh, this surprises nobody, right? So you have the mont jean energy here. So then that, this is nice and con convex. So that having a nice slope at infinity, check mark. The interesting thing here is perhaps here. So the supremum of all taus such that you have tau with negative lambda is integrable. Now, the thing that I have to explain to you is what u hat tau is. u hat tau is the Legendre, time Legend transform of my subgeodesic ray. So this is where we start sort of deep diving into the Roswit-Nistrom correspondence, right? So in the Roswit-Nistrom correspondence, I know that I'm actually better off studying the subgeodesic or geodesic by studying its time Legend transform. Right? So here, this is what we get, right? Now, <coughs> there's a integrability exponent in interpretation of, of this, uh, this formula here as well, right? So what this says is that the integrability exponent of u hat tau is at least lambda, right? Is at least lambda for tau in R. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking for the biggest tau for which the integrability exponent is at least lambda. I'll, again, I'll, I'll, I'll expand this a little bit more if, if I will have some time. Similar formulas I've seen in BBJ, uh, also various papers of books on Jonsson, not, not, not quite in this form. So this is again tailored to a very, very analytic uh, treatment. Uh, and then one thing I should say is this is definitely inspired from a not paper not too long ago by Ming Chen and myself, itself inspired from a paper, a, a, a lemma of Bu fr from a uh, conference volume to, I don't know, I think he was, I wouldn't be surprised if he wouldn't recognize it though, but yes, thank you Bu again. Uh, and, and that's not the first time that was said during this conference either, right? So, yes, so, so let's try to absorb this as much as we can, and I'll get back to it. It's sort of a critical observation. 
Uh, okay, so the other sort of critical observation is the next theorem. Uh, this gives you a interpretation of the delta invariant as geodesic uh, semi-stability or, or uniform geodesic stability threshold, right? So we, we prove that the delta invariant, in this case the twisted, twisted delta invariant, is the threshold of semi-stability using sub-geodesic rays of uh, the family D lambda, right? So you start, so for, for lambda very, very small, D lambda is actually wrong, right? So uh, for, for, for small positive lambdas, this class is not empty. And the question is, for how big of a lambda will, will this condition still hold? Well, the supremum is actually the uh, twisted delta invariant. And there is sort of this uniform version. So if you look at unit speed geodesic rays, then you can ask the same question. So for what, uh, uh, what's the biggest lambda for which the slope of these ding energies uh, is uh, bigger than a fixed constant? And that will also give you uh, uh, the delta invariant. Now, let me just, I don't know, this is some, some, you, some of you might know. So d lambda squiggly bracket u t is the slope of d lambda along this geodesic ring. Right? So as I said, this limit might not exist as t goes to infinity, so you take the limit. So every time you see a squiggly bracket, it means basically the slope of that energy along. Okay, good. Now, again, I've seen versions of this in the ample case in papers by Buxom Jonsson, sometimes in a non Archimedean context, sometimes not. Also saw it in a paper by Kewei Zhang. And this, again, I wish my memory would serve me better, but it's definitely implicit in, in BBJ already. Robert disagrees, okay. I'm, you, I'm giving you too much credit. Who knew? Exactly, right? Exactly. Okay. Uh, good. So, uh, yeah, I I think it's implicitly there. Let's let's move on. Now, again, so what I'm trying to say here is that I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if something like this, uh, uh, you know, people already saw. Hence, it's more believable, right? Now, the thing that I want to emphasize on, depending on how much. Time I actually have left. How much time do I have left? Lots of time? Very little time? No time? Yes. Some, some, some. That's not a ve some time. Okay, good. My <laughs> okay, so Robert asked. So, so there, there's one thing I didn't mention, and it's also one of the, as I said, perceived novelties here. We don't use the K energy in, in our discussion. So, so, so that was missing. I just, as I said, Convexity of the ding energy is non-negotiable, but uh, K energy, we don't bother. Now, uh, in, in, even in the Kähler case, uh, this uh, could, uh, so even if you don't care about the big case at all, this could change the perspective a little bit on, on some things. So since this was already asked and discussed also with other people, let me try to emphasize in like two, like I have three slides, how you get away with not having convexity of the K energy, which in the big case, by the way, we don't have at all. We don't even know. So there's a result by uh, Eleonora and Shin that treats the big and F case, and they point out there that in the big case, it's not even clear what you should write down as your K energy in general. There's a twisted term, and you know, it's, it's, it's a good question. So one wants to get away with it. So, so let's see. Let's see what we propose. So, Let's, again, let's, we're in the Kähler case, right? So the minimal singularity type is just zero. Uh, is, so the minimal potential with minimal singularity type is zero. And I assume that I'm stable, right? So this twisted delta is positive. Okay, so if the ding energy were coercive, then there would exist automatically a Kähler Einstein metric, right? So I'm assuming it's not, it's not coercive. So the story pretty much starts uh, in the same manner. Uh, 
if only I wouldn't introduce this sort of auxiliary ding energy. So this auxiliary ding energy uh, with the running parameter beta that I'm fixing between 0 and 1 is the ding energy minus a sort of uh, J term, right? So this is uh, like a J energy. Uh, so uh, immediately it's a, you, you might see that this, this is a bit strange, right? So this is convex along geodesics. This is also convex because this is linear and this is convex, right? So convex minus convex typically is nothing, right? So it's, this, it's almost as if I'm doing something really, really crazy and bad. If not, if you don't recognize that I am working with potentials later on, whose supremum is always going to be zero. So I, I, I will be constructing genus rays starting from uh, the zero potential. Right? In that case, you know that the soup is going to be linear. Right? So there's this observation. Uh, so this term here, which is typically convex along geodesics, is going to be linear. So linear minus linear. So this d beta that's sort of adjusted by a j term is, is for the data that I will put in will be convex. So, you know, not, maybe not so crazy. But again, I, you, I haven't told you what the point is yet. Okay, d beta is still convex. Good. Let's see how that's going to be helpful. Okay. Uh, okay, so, so now comes what I... Okay, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. So since d1 is not proper, then I play the same game that many people that read BBJ will recognize. That means that for every j, I will find a potential whose supremum is zero, uh, giving you this bad inequality, right? So if you were proper, such a thing you could not do for, for some j eventually. Uh, and also, not too difficult to argue that if, if, if something like this holds, then uh, the, the, these potent bad potentials phi j has to be sort of further and further out from uh, the Kähler potential theta. Okay, good. So again, you know what I'm about to do, right? Uh, maybe, maybe not. So again, now we're involving uh, this uh, twisted energy D beta. So, so look what's going on. So look at this condition. Okay, I have this uh, inequality. Uh, if I were to place D beta here, then I would get this extra term here. That's beta times a J term, which is, again, the J energy is proportional to D1, right? Beta is fixed, so the same sequence will give me this estimate, that D beta over phi J is actually less than minus epsilon over the length of, uh, sorry, the distance between 0 and phi J. And again, so this is the same sequence, so I'm just repeating here that the distance between 0 and phi J goes to infinity. Okay, so again, I'm just carrying this information with me, and it's still not clear how this uh, is going to help me. And now I'm doing the thing that is done uh, uh, in BBJ, which is I'm forming these uh, segments from, so it's a unit speed geodesic segments, joining 0 and phi j. Okay, so 0 has supremum 0 and phi j has supremum 0, so all the potentials along all these segments have supremum equal to 0. So the d beta is convex along all these geodesic segments. So then I will get these estimates for free uh, for any time in between, so in between time uh, uh, on these geodesic segments, right? So, so far everybody knows that nothing crazy should happen, okay? Now, I noticed that the supremum of, as I told you, I'm, not, I'm sort of reminding myself that the uh, su supremum of all these potentials is zero. So I can run a diagonal argument uh, in L1, so, so weak L1. In weak L1, I run a diagonal argument, and I get a sub-geodesic UT uh, such that, well, perhaps after taking a subsequence, of course, which I, which I, which I can always do, and each UJT will convention the UT with respect to L1 in this weak topology. Okay, now, again, uh, it's a very small line here that I want to gloss over, right? Uh, you can only do this for uh, T, not for all time T, but for almost every time T, right? I mean, it's sort of a Fubini theorem that gives you this. 
But you, you let me get away with this because you're definitely sure that the Titanic will, will, will sink in a, in a minute, right? So we're getting to the critical situation. The critical situation is here, right? So the limit will satisfy some things and not others, right? So uh, this slope formula I still have because d beta is lower semi-continuous with respect to L1, right? So, it's, it's, uh, so the exponential part is actually continuous with respect to L1, but the i part is upper semi-continuous, so minus the upper part is lower semi-continuous. So th this gets the check mark. The supremum is preserved because sup x is continuous with respect to weak L1. But he, he, here, here's the problem, right? So this is where the Titanic is sinking. Uh, I would prefer to have this equal to negative t, right? So now collapsing might have occurred. I cannot rule out that this ut in the worst possible scenario is actually the zero geodesic, right? That's no good, right? So, and then previously, this is where the wisdom stopped. Okay. This is where d beta comes in. So, okay, I don't know if this ut is trivial or not, but I can put it into my d beta and look at the slope formula. It's theorem 3, so it was this, uh, this, this slope formula. Uh, and I get the following thing. So, okay, maybe. Oh, the thank you. Okay, that's coming, that's coming. Don't worry, one more slide. Uh, uh, right, okay. The punchline is, thank you. <laughs> yes, uh, we're getting close to the punchline. Uh, so now, uh, right, so the d beta, the, the slope of ut along the d beta, it can be expressed in this formula. And I know that this is, has to be less than epsilon. Okay, but I'm very concerned that ut is, is collapsing. So what does that mean? So there's this notion of maximal geodesic rays in, uh, in uh, the DEJ papers. Uh, if you have a sub-geodesic, there's a geodesic ray that's sitting below it, but it's sort of sitting on top of it, but it's sort of minimal in nature. Now, you have collapsing uh, in, in, this, in this situation if the slope of the mont jean energy is identically zero, right? I, I'm, I'm, I'm sup-normalizing. So if this guy were to vanish completely, then it's bad. It's bad. That's what I want to avoid. Okay, so I take this maximization. If, if, if my sub-geodesic collapses, the maximization will be the zero uh, geodesic ray. Now, uh, in... Uh, in uh, the ross nistrom correspondence, the maximization corresponds to taking the Legendre transforms uh, p maximization in every time, right? So uh, again, uh, I will have this nice formula. So v is my maximization, v hat is p u hat tau. And this is the formula for that, for those that uh, don't know. Now, uh, using, now, now comes in the value criteria for integrability. This P operator does nothing to the long numbers, not just on X, but on every birational model. So all the integrability exponents of V tau hat and U tau hat will be the same. Moreover, also the slope of the I energy will be the same. So the slope of UT and its maximization will be the same. So I have the same inequality here with Vs as I had with Us. Okay, so let's assume the V was trivial, meaning this is zero. Okay, if that is zero, then the only way this is negative, if some of the integrability exponents here, right, will have to uh, go, be become, uh, what? So, so, yes, so if this is negative, then uh, the integrability exponents have to be less, uh, sorry, what do they have to be? Yes. Uh, yeah, so the supremum, what's going on? Right, so the, the integrability exponent of all the V thetas, yes, has to be equal to the integrability exponent of uh, zero, greater than one. 
But that's absurd because that means that this will be zero as well. So I will get zero is strictly less than minus epsilon. No good. Contradiction. So, you know, I get, I basically, even though in this condition there might be collapsing, I will not get that the slope of the i's uh, as t goes to infinity is, is zero, right? So this sub geodesic sort of survives uh, the collapsing. It might collapse a little bit, but not too much. So then what you do is uh, essentially uh, renormalize this geodesic ray uh, Vt, because it might, it might have lost some speed, but I just argue that you know, it's still alive, so you renormalize it. Since d beta had negative slope, it will still have negative slope if you renormalize it. And okay, so now comparing the formula for d beta and d1, you will get what? That this uh, renormalized ray will have uh, ding slope less than beta. So I have a units, family of unit speed rays whose ding slope is as small as I want. Okay, so then this says what? Well, this says that the uniform geodesic stability threshold cannot be bigger than one, right? And then this is a contradiction with the other theorem that I mentioned, with, with this line, right? So we started out with asking this guy to be positive, and I just cooked up a family of rays that for lambda equals to 1 will give you no such epsilon lambda uniform constant. 